Please pray with me. Thank you, loving God, for this time as we are together in the midst of your creation and on the continuum of eternity. We pray, loving God, that in this moment we are able to receive from you all that you have for us in this time. We pray that we are then able to take it with us and use it in the days, the minutes, the hours that we have as such precious gifts. Continue to bless us and anoint us as we're together in worship and hospitality. Continue to enable us to grow in community and to love one another as you first loved us. Let us be in this time further anointed so that among all the words that come our way as we speak and read and sing and hear and pray, the word that you have for us as individuals is what is with us for now and when we go from here. Bless us in this time as you have blessed so many before us, and let it be that we are able to pray as the psalmist prayed so many years ago, that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Sometimes people like to use the story of Jesus ejecting the money changers from the Jerusalem temple grounds as a basis for churches not having bake sales or other fundraising events in consecrated church buildings being kind of people of the tent, as it were, we're, we're not bound by that. Um, it is, I hope, no shock to anyone to hear me say, uh, that's not the point. This gospel story is not so much about fundraising or even asking for donations to keep the temple operating budget going and solvent. It is a counteraction to religious manipulation of personal piety and setting exclusionary boundaries on general expectations of God's love and grace. This gospel story is about divine participation in protesting that manipulation and discrimination. It's about saying religious faith is primarily about devotion to God and that, and that devotion is based in familiar relationships and justice seeking, not judgmental hoop jumping or spiritual blackmail. Now stay with me for just a few more minutes. This is a story that many people remember, perhaps mostly because we see Jesus get angry and toss some tables around. We remember the voice of Jesus saying in Revised Standard Version, my God's house is a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. At least we think we remember that way. We think we remember it that way. What many of us are hearing is a blend of the story because it appears in all four Gospels. And a compilation of our impressions overlays each story in our memories. In this version of, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is portrayed as driven and angry. He even cracks a whip, but he is not as harsh-mouthed as in other Gospels. John's Gospel writer calls what many remember, myself included, as a den of thieves, as just a marketplace. You've turned this religious institution into the mall. Today, we are not going to spend all our time doing a word study on this passage and others because we have a few other things to do this morning. That's what Bible Bites on Wednesday night <laughs> is all about. What I hope we will take with us is that all the gospel writers we have in the Holy Bible thought this was an important story. It's important to know that manip the manipulation and discrimination that were inherent in the market system, which was selling various levels of sacrifice livestock, from birds to cattle, to people of various means, was a way of providing discrimination to how good you thought you could be by how much you were able to 
uh, pay for offering something in sacrifice in your religious pilgrimage to Jerusalem, perhaps once in your lifetime. People were making their faith journey and practicing their piety in the temple. And what was happening is that the religious authorities were manipulating them and providing discrimination, which is what became condemned by the four gospel voices of Jesus, unanimously. I have the impression that we who hope to continue the heritage of this faith ought to be on the lookout for manipulation and discrimination in religious systems and make sure we do not perpetuate them. Perhaps there are times when we need to condemn them, condemn them with protest and even crack a whip. There are many people under the influence of spiritual and religious malpractice, which I would define as any belief or teaching that results in people not feeling full trust that God embraces them eternally with love. I find it tough to cope with the number of people who have self-doubts about the cosmic and divine love that is in our lives. In a closed professional Facebook community I follow, a personal story of one of the members talks about all the things going on in the 24 hours of one pastor's life, a day in the life. And after presenting some details that I won't go into because we won't have 24 hours to spend together <laughs> this morning, the person writes something very sad and disturbing. And here is the blurb. And then today, I am sitting in a fa with a family in the intensive care unit after their 40-year-old gay son hanged himself. There is no brain activity. Goes on to say, last night I addressed the 25 or so kids in our youth group and told them all in the name of the church that everybody was going to learn at least one thing. God loves you and so do we. I wish I could have told that to the man in intensive care. When I arrived at the ICU, the man's dad stood immediately and asked if death, if suicide, is unforgivable. Now apparently, the 40-year-old man possessed, the 40-year-old man's father possessed a theology that included the possibility that our God who is love would for this one action not receive unfettered the soul of his son in a death by suicide. That kind of thinking is out there all over the place. And every day in my ministry here with Bloom, that is exactly the table of fear-mongering theology that I think needs to be overturned. And I think we should use whips if ever we need to. As you heard in the Gospel reading, the official reaction to Jesus rearranging the furniture and stampeding the animals and helping the birds fly the coop was negative. Fake news today would headline the event saying, Homeless man terrorizes temple. Religious business not allowed to follow through. Rabbi goes off his rocker. <laughs> but the demand for a sign is the age-old discrediting of reformers and prophets in their roles that conventional communities always find disquieting and powerful people often <coughs> want to crush. Instead of that, I hope we can emulate the idea presented in a fanciful story I read the other day it's one of those stories that does not have to be great or true in order for it to communicate a great truth. Well, what I heard was that St. Peter and Angel Gabriel had a problem. Peter was sorting people at the pearly gates, letting some in and keeping others out, as fake theology leads many to believe is his heavenly job. But Gabriel was finding more people in heaven than Peter was letting in. 
they were befuddled. Gabriel told Peter to keep working, and he would go and get to the bottom of this. After a few hours, Angel Gabriel came back and told St. Peter not to worry. He'd figured it out. It's Jesus. He's been seen pulling people over the wall. <laughs> Whenever we come up to any sorts of walls in our lives, it's good to remember this image of Jesus helping us over. And as the body of Christ on earth, it is true and great that our job is the same. In all we do, let's not let the walls of manipulation and discrimination keep people from knowing and trusting that the eternal source of the universe who is called God created them good and the cosmic arms of love are open to all of us. Hopefully that's why we're gathered here. And that's the mission and message we serve our communities. And that's what we can hold in our hearts as we share in Holy Communion together. <coughs> Thanks be to God. Amen. The Integrated cr Crusade was in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1953. After the ropes cordoning off the black section of the auditorium were removed, Graham told the ushers who threatened to put them back up, either those ropes stay down or you can go on and have the revival without me. And from then on, Graham permanently adopted the policy of holding only integrated revivals. That's something. And then I read a blog post by Mel White. Anyone know Mel White? Mel, Mel White wrote the book Stranger at the Gate. It's in our Bloom uh, uh, library. Uh, Mel White is an out gay man now. He's an author I trust. He was, clo he was a closeted evangelical writer for many years, and he ghost wrote the books that were sent out by Pat Robertson and uh, uh, Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham. And in this blog post that I put on Facebook, uh, Mel goes through an extensive explanation of his relationship with Billy Graham as a result of being his ghostwriter. And I posted about that, giving his gay man's perspective on the transformation that Billy Graham experienced in his life and the obstacles that he faced in trying to be able to communicate that transformation. One example he gives is this. During the contentious battle over Oregon's Proposition 9, Graham was asked by a chairman of his evangelistic crusade in Portland to endorse the measure that would require the state of Oregon to declare homosexuality a condition that was abnormal, wrong, unnatural, and perverse. That's good legislation, isn't it? <laughs> Graham replied, according to Mel White, and said and was recorded as saying, I intend to stay out of national and local politics while here. God loves all people, whatever their ethnic or political background or their sexual orientation. Christians take opposing views on many issues. Those on both sides of the issue must love one another. Throughout our lives, we make many decisions. Some are much more important than others. I mention this obvious reality and ask us to be aware of how the decisions we make will not only affect us, but will affect others. Whenever we take up our crosses and consider the status of our souls, just make them be for goodness sake. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.